Hi, it's Mr. Reese from Malmesbury Science, and I'm here to show you how to do the A-level physics practical determination of G via a free-form method. Now, there are a few ways that you can do this, but the way that I do it is with a piece of card and a light gate, or a photo gate. Here is my light gate here. Every time something passes in between the beam, the data logger that it's connected to starts timing. So effectively, this is just a posh stop clock. It times how long it takes for the card to go through the beam. It then calculates speed. In order to do that, it needs to know distance or length. And so you need to put in the length of the card, that is the length that is falling through the light gate into your data logger. Mine is 10 centimeters long, and it's actually a folded piece of card to be 10 centimeters altogether with a bit of blue tack at the bottom and then just seal together with some blue tack. Why blue tack at the bottom? Well, it's to make it bottom heavy. The best place that you would want to do this experiment is in a vacuum because ideally you don't want any air resistance providing a force that is opposite to the card's weight. The more the card weighs, however, the less air resistance has an effect. Weighing down the card as well means that it's less likely to fall through at an angle. If it did that, that means that the length of 10 centimeters might not be correct for the calculation. Now you might be able to see that I've put a line halfway up the card as well. What we're gonna be doing is dropping this card from various heights. And I have my light gate here. I've obviously put it high enough off the table that my card can pass through and hit the ground without bouncing back up and crossing the beam again. And I have my ruler clamped very close to avoid any parallax error and the like. I've clamped it so the zero is right at the midpoint, so the bottom of the ruler is in line with the beam itself in the light gate. So we're gonna be dropping this from 10 centimeters up to say, well, we're gonna see how high we can go while still getting the card through. The higher you go, the harder it is to hit the target. 10 centimeters is here, but this raises a question. How am I going to line up the card? Am I gonna be lining up the bottom of the card with this or the top of the card? And this is a bit of an issue because as the card goes through, it's still accelerating. And so that means that whatever velocity the data logger records, that's an average speed that the card goes through the light gate with. So the question is, at what point with the card going through the light gate is that velocity correct? And we can't be sure. So what we'll say is that we're going to line up the halfway mark on the card up with our ruler. And so that way we can say, well, we know that the velocity is going to be correct somewhere in between it entering and exiting. And then we can say, well, the uncertainty in the distance is going to be half the length of the card. You can take that into account if you want, it's up to you. So I'm gonna line up the midpoint of my card that I've measured with the 10 centimeter mark on the ruler. Now there is gonna be some parallax error here. How can I be exactly sure that I'm at 10 centimeters? Well, if you wanna be super accurate, you could get a set square or a triangular piece of paper and you could attach that to the ruler, which extends over here. And so you can be sure that you've actually got the right height. But for now, I'm just gonna line this up and see what our first speed is. The data logger is giving me a speed of 1.27 meters per second. And it's calculated that because I've already put the length of the card in. Let's do it a second time. We definitely want to do repeats with this experiment. And a third time. Calculating a mean average of those three speeds. Then I'm going to drop the card from 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters, and so on three times and get an average speed for each distance. So here are all of my readings. Now, if we think about SUVAT, we're dealing with S. U is always going to be zero because we're just dropping it. And as an aside, it's important that you do drop it. You don't push it downwards or push it upwards as you let go. V, well, our data logger is recording that, and A, that's our acceleration. We want to find that. So the equation that we want is V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. U is always zero, so that just turns into V squared equals 2AS. So that goes to show that we can't draw a graph of V against S because they're not proportional. It's V squared that's proportional to S. So we must square all of our average speeds to find v squared, and here they are. Now if we plot the graph of v squared against s, if we find the line of best fits gradient, then we end up with v squared against s. Now my gradient ends up being 18.6. Now according to the equation v squared equals 2as, if we rearrange it to find v squared divided by s, which is our gradient, that gives us 2a, or 2g in our case, because that's what we're looking for. So therefore, if 18.6 is equal to two times acceleration due to gravity, then all we have to do is half it, and that gives us an acceleration due to gravity of 9.3 meters per second squared. Would we expect it to be lower than 9.8? Well, yes, we would, because air resistance does have an effect in reality in the experiment. This experiment is a good opportunity to flex your muscles regarding uncertainties. 
what you should do is find the range of your velocities for each distance and then half that that's going to be your uncertainty in your average speed but because we're going to v squared we therefore have to find the percentage uncertainty in each average speed to then go to v squared we double this percentage uncertainty and then we can turn that back into an absolute uncertainty plot that on our graph as error bars then find a line of worst fit to find the percentage uncertainty in your gradient then we take the gradient of the line of worst fit take away the line of best fit divide by the line of best fits original gradient and then times by 100. because this is just equal to 2g that therefore means that that percentage uncertainty is going to be the same for g itself and then you can therefore find a final absolute uncertainty in g from that